it's great to be here. It's, uh, as usual, a wonderful meeting, and I'm pleased to see everybody here. Um, Franklin Chang Diaz walked into my laboratory in something like uh, 1970 uh, looking for work. Well, I was always in need of somebody to work, but I didn't have any money, so he, he decided he'd work for free for a while. Uh, later on, he uh, caved in and went to work for somebody that actually paid him, uh, <laughs> which is actually a very wise idea, I, th I think. Um, <clears throat> anyway, he had come from Costa Rica, and he was very interested in, in becoming an astronaut. And um, uh, he had played Buck Rogers when he was a kid, and he wrote a letter to Werner von Braun when he saw the Sputniks going over and uh, got a letter back which told him he ought to get himself a degree in science or mathematics or engineering or something like that. So we wound up at the University of Connecticut. It was great to have him in the lab. Uh, he and I uh, worked quite a bit together. He, we talk about him as if he was my student, but he was wise enough never to take a class from me. <laughs> well, mostly I was teaching uh, pre-med types of the non-calculus variety and so forth. Well, we did a lot of things together, including working on cars. And uh, one, one time uh, I saw him and he had just worked on his car. Um, he usually did it in my garage, but this one was uh, he had a transmission go out. And so he uh, hitched a ride into Hartford and he got himself a, a used transmission at a used parts emporium and went back and he swapped out his transmission in his driveway. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever lain on your back changing a transmission in a gravel driveway, but I think it's probably not very comfortable. <clears throat> anyway, he did it. And then he found out that the... Um, the new transmission, which came out of the same model car, was about this much longer than the old transmission. <laughs> made in Canada, Taiwan, who knows wherever it was made. Different, that's just the way they do things in that racket. So he picked up, he lived uh, more or less on the southeast uh, corner of the campus of the University of Connecticut, which also included a high school and so forth. He lived over there carried his drive shaft about a mile over to the physics building, let himself into the machine shop, and he used the crankshaft shortener, or the, the drive shaft shortener. He cut out a section, welded it back together, carried it back, and that was this car, worked out just fine. <clears throat> um, another, another story he told me, and this is, this is kind of interesting, um, uh, the, as, as, by the way, he's been launched seven times, but they were doing some stuff with the Russians, and the Russians decided that, oh my God, what would happen if, if this uh, space capsule came down someplace in Siberia? Um, we don't have the DDP there uh, prepared to handle the thing. Maybe they're out in the wilderness, and so what can, what can you do? So, okay, the Americans agreed, and they went ahead and uh, plunked down a bunch of astronauts, and some American, some Russian, out in the middle of Siberia uh, in a space capsule complete with their parachute, their parachute. And uh, <clears throat> so what does uh, Franklin do? He said, well, he saw over there some trees that looked like um, aspens, birch, beech, you know, that kind of family. And they had a chainsaw, not one that you start like this, and it was boom, but one that you operate with your fingers like that. <clears throat> so they went over there and used that as a tree shortener and cut out a, a bunch of these, uh, they're about perhaps that big around, whatever, stood them up, lashed them at the top with something or another, put the parachute over it so it looked like a, an Indian teepee. Well, now here's the story. <clears throat> here's this guy from Costa Rica out in the middle of Siberia showing the Russians how the Indians protected themselves from the weather in the, United, in the Americas. So <laughs> that was pretty funny. <clears throat> anyway, um, if, if you are um, 
going to be involved in a venture where things can happen that are rather unexpected. You want to have someone around who is, um, let's say, creative, courageous, cool under fire, and so forth. Well, you want somebody like Franklin. That probably explains why he was launched seven times. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, um, after he left UConn, he went to MIT, he got his PhD in nuclear engineering, and then he got into the astronaut program. Hey, there we, it, was, it, was, it was plasma engineering, right? Pl whatever. Um, it's pretty good. So anyway, without further ado, let me introduce Franklin Chang Diaz. And by the way, uh, his better half is Peggy, who is an MD uh, who, is wor who worked at NASA until they flitted off to uh, Costa Rica a few years ago. So. Thanks a lot. I put together a, a bit of a journey of uh, mostly photographs of things and to illustrate, um, you know, the, 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 what I think of as the American adventure, as uh, Howard pointed it out. You know, I too, uh, just like many young boys in the 1950s, um, dreamed about going to space. I mean, th this was not something that only American boys and girls, maybe, um, dreamed about. But um, children all over the world were you know, fascinated by uh, the, uh, the thought about going into space, being ex space explorers. And we, we all used to uh, play as space explorers. I used to have my own rocket ship. It was a, 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 a cardboard box uh, which uh, had chairs uh, uh, flipped on their, on their backs. And you know, I would sit there, uh, lay there with my, um, my cousins and my friends, and we would actually go through a, a countdown and lift off and, and go out into space. And we would explore um, other planets land and fight monsters and so on and come back come back in time for dinner you know so that, that's uh, something that we all did and so um, at a very early age the, you know the 1957 launch of Sputnik was a tremendous <coughs> moment for many young people all over the planet so I just wanted to point that out right at the beginning and then um, the launch of the first human being uh, into space, uh, Yuri Gagarin, was also a very significant moment, a moment also where, you know, the space program was really a very binary um, activity between two superpowers. It was just United States here, Soviet Union here. They were, you know, duking it out in the sky and we were just mere spectators. The rest of the world, we were just watching, awe, in awe of what was going on, and dreamed about all the possibilities that came, came after. So I um, was in my high school uh, uh, in Costa Rica in 1965. I was 15 years old, uh, already building rockets. Uh, this one uh, was uh, one of the ones we uh, built uh, with a couple of my friends. This one had uh, three stages, um, and we used to make our own gunpowder and our own uh, fuses and our own fast uh, igniters. Second stage, uh, and also a little capsule, and here uh, in this little capsule we had a little mouse, and we put actually a white mouse with a little helmet that we did build a hel helmet for the mouse and, and a parachute, there's a parachute right there. And we launched uh, this, this rocket uh, from uh, the soccer field. Uh, it, it was a partial failure, a partial success. The first stage didn't work, the second stage did work, went up, the rocket, the second stage went up about 100 uh, or so meters. And um, the uh, capsule popped out uh, and came down on the parachute, and, and uh, the mouse did survive. It was, uh, <laughs> the mouse survived. We uh, got him, uh, and he escaped, and we never saw him again. Just <laughs> a mouse. But that was, that was um, 
for me, uh, I had already decided that I was going to try to somehow participate in the space program in some manner, and I wasn't going to go to Russia. I was going to go to the U.S., and what Howard said is true. I actually wrote a letter to Von Braun, and, um, uh, you know, at the time that uh, uh, when he wrote back, he, he, he wasn't he who wrote back, it was... Uh, uh, Bart Slattery, Jr., who was NASA's uh, head of public relations, and it was just a form letter that uh, told me uh, that, uh, you know, we are very encouraged to see that people are interested in our space program, uh, and I think I may even have, um, I, don't have I don't have it here, but um, in that letter, it was a form letter, and in those days there were no yellow markers, um, but somebody had taken the trouble to take a, um, a ruler, and with a red uh, crayon, they had underlined a sentence that said, um, uh, jobs or careers with NASA <clears throat> are limited to United States citizens. And, you know, the way I interpreted this, you know, I didn't speak English, of course. I, I, I had this letter translated to me. And the way I interpreted this was not really the way they thought they wanted to tell me. They basically were telling me, you know, don't, don't even think of it or don't think of it. The way I interpreted it is, you know, come on over. Come on over. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so I did. I did. I, um, I landed in Hartford, Connecticut. In those days, it was a lot easier to, uh, to come to the United States. The United States uh, was, and in my mind, it still is, the land of opportunity. And we all came, I came too, um, alone. I was 18 years old. I had graduated from high school. Uh, my father, a uh, um, very wise person, gave me a one-way ticket to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, um, here is the ticket, uh, it's a one-way ticket, uh, and um, if you really run into trouble, just write us back and we'll, think you, we'll get you back. But he knew that in those days there was no email, no internet, no uh, way of communicating easily, and telephones were very expensive, so I would have to write a letter, uh, which would take a couple of months to get there. And by the time the response com comes back, it would have been already too late. I mean, the, the, the problem would have been resolved, and I, he knew that, and so he... Um, let me um, then go, and I entered the University of Connecticut. I actually went to high school again in Hartford. I learned English, uh, the, the little bit of English that I know. I, I learned it uh, in Hartford, uh, in, at the uh, Hartford Public High School. And um, the uh, professors or teachers from the high school, because I, uh, I did pretty well in, 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 this, in the courses, uh, recommended me for a scholarship uh, to the University of Connecticut. And so uh, I was very happy. I went, you know, I had the foot in the door. I went to the University of Connecticut to register. And they told me, uh, well, we made a mistake. And uh, the mistake was that they thought I was from Puerto Rico and not from Costa Rica. <laughs> And so there was a mistake. And as a result, uh, because being from Costa Rica means that I'm not a, I was not a US citizen, uh, I did not have the right to have the scholarship, even though I had uh, all the academic requirements and all the credentials to do so. So I was very upset. I went back to the school and let them know. And they, you know, this is the most American thing that has ever happened. Uh, and that is, they actually wrote a petition to the Connecticut State Legislature about what had happened, and the Connecticut Legislature um, had an ex extraordinary meeting, or some sort of a something, and they decided to grant the scholarship anyway, because they had made a mistake. And this, to me, uh, embodies, you know, the fairness of 
the American society. And that's, this is what I always like about this country, that you could actually come here with nothing and rise to the highest peaks. Anyway, so I had my foot in the door in 1969. I watched um, Neil Armstrong land on the moon. I was at the student union at the, um, at the University of Connecticut, and shortly after that, I met Howard. And you know, we, we began an uh, interactive uh, friendship that has lasted for four decades or more, something like that. Space program was in its height. The United States won the race. We all know that. And then it all stopped. President Nixon canceled the program. Um, and I remember I had a professor uh, of aerospace at the University of Connecticut who told me, don't even think about going into aerospace because you will never get a job. And I'm glad I didn't pay attention to that. So. But I decided to take a little detour, and I, I went into um, nuclear power. And particularly, I was interested in, in thermonuclear uh, fusion research. I went to MIT, and that's when I started working in plasma physics. At the time, 1973, I had graduated from uh, UConn, started my graduate studies. Skylab started. And uh, then there was a tremendous hiatus. The shuttle program had been, had been um, approved. But there was a hiatus. I went into fusion research, fascinated with the prospects of, of developing a fusion reactor to deal with the energy problems. Uh, but it was just a fascinating uh, technology project. And then um, in 1977, I had now enough years in the United States I had applied for permanent residency. I became a permanent resident. And then in 77, I became a citizen of the United States. And um, I joined the workforce at Draper Labs and began to watch the space program, which was exactly what I wanted to, to do. And right at that moment, you see like the, you know, the alignment of the planets, um, NASA issued a, uh, a call for a new group of astronauts for the space shuttle program, and they were looking for scientists. And I applied. And um, I did, I, and I got selected. 1980, I joined in the class of 1980, which you see all, all of us here when we were very young. There's uh, the administrator of NASA today, right there. I'm sitting right there, right next to him and began a journey of wonder that I will forever you know, cherish. And I will tell my children and my grandchildren about this because I had the opportunity to fly so many, so many flights. This is my first flight, first group. We were very young. This was uh, STS-61C on the Space Shuttle Columbia. Uh, after this flight had landed, 10 days later, we uh, suffered the disaster from Challenger and uh, things changed uh, completely. But the flights did resume, and uh, later on I flew again on uh, the Galileo mission, deploying the first and probably the only nuclear device ever launched on the space shuttle. It was the Galileo spacecraft, and we had anti-nuclear demonstrators that threatened to change themselves to the uh, launch pad. Um, so that we would not launch the Galileo, not thinking about why is it that people do these kinds of things. But in that flight, I wanted to show you this one because I think most of you are doctors and this was the first time that we ever did telemedicine. Um, I'm, I'm doing a, an examination here of Ellen, who is a physician. Uh, his, uh, her retina uh, was actually downloading the live image of the retinal photography down to mission control for the doctors to see that. And I think that that was one of the early, this was 1980, 89, I think, that we did this. Uh, and of course, now this is all done all the time. I got the chance to fly to the Mir station and began to train with that other group of spacefaring uh, individuals uh, that we always thought were so mysterious, 
And we found out uh, in the end that they really are pretty much like we are. And they're doing about the same things that we do. And, uh, but they do it in a different way. This is, uh, this is a, a, a suit training exercise in, in Russia, in the Siberia uh, uh, act activity that uh, Howard mentioned. And, you know, I might as well just be sitting in my grandmother's living room. Um, there was no clean room, no uh, fuzz about putting this thing on, and the thing works. Uh, and we were um, here, the three of us. Yeah. This was a very interesting um, um, sort of pictorial, uh, you know, here we have a, a crew uh, which is about to get into that uh, capsule that Howard spoke about in to, to do uh, winter survival in uh, Siberia. And we, uh, two of us, were the Americans. And one of them was, uh, one of us was uh, the Russian. The Russian is uh, Oleg uh, Kotov right here, who happens to be a, a, a medical doctor too. But here are the two Americans, one from Costa Rica and the other one from India. <laughs> you go figure. You know? And the Russians just couldn't, couldn't understand that. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't understand that, you know, that which is the country that we have. And um, this is the uh, actual event, and this is the teepee that Howard talked about. And uh, it, was, it had never been done before. The Russians always thought the Americans were very, very weak. They couldn't uh, really uh, withstand the Russian winter, the, the, the rigidness of the Russian winter. And, you know, I had spent some time in Montana. I had learned to do uh, uh, teepees, and, and so uh, this is the way Americans handle the Russian winter. And it uh, turns out that now um, uh, this is a standard procedure in uh, Russian winter survival. We did very well. In fact, the, uh, the crew, uh, television crew from Moscow came because they were looking at how the Americans were dealing with the winter survival. And they were freezing outside. We had a roaring fire inside this uh, teepee. And we told them, yeah, come on in, have some tea, you know, uh, get out of the cold. So this was a, a very interesting exercise. Um, later on, uh, things got more modern. And we now um, began to work uh, on the International Space Station. I had a chance to fly there, too and contribute to its uh, assembly, its construction. This is one of the EVAs uh, that uh, I did uh, together with uh, Philippe Perrin from, from uh, France. Uh, we did quite a bit of work. Here's uh, one of the sites uh, as you uh, get transported on the end of the arm from one point of the station to another. Really a very powerful uh, moment to be alone there, to be uh, looking all by yourself so you feel very, very defense, defenseless, very, very fragile, and you are. I mean, anything can happen. Particularly, any washer, any screw or bolt or piece of uh, debris coming from uh, satellites, uh, if you get hit, you probably will die. So this is a very unforgiving environment. And yet, we have learned to work pretty well and things are, go are going rather well in space these days. This is the space station as it looks today. It's a very large object. There is a space shuttle in comparison. And here you see all of the assembly together with the uh, European ATV, Automated Transfer Vehicle, the US uh, Space uh, Shuttle, the uh, Russian Soyuz vehicles, and it gives you now the sense that the chemistry has changed. It's no longer an activity of the United States and uh, Russia. It is a very multinational activity and growing. The number of spacefaring nations is increasing. People are beginning to move. And now the private sector is moving into this game. And this is the way it should be. Space should be available to everyone. It should not be just the realm of a few. Because if it is, then we're doing something wrong. We have to make it such that it is just like flying in an airplane today. That's uh, the way it needs to go. This is what the space station looks like. It is a magnificent piece of engineering, all put together by 
people who speak different languages, have different cultures, but they all know physics, they all know math, they all know engineering, and they all have something to contribute. I want to show you some pictures from what it looks like uh, from out there. This is a view of uh, the Amazon basin uh, in central Brazil. These are some uh, areas of deforestation. We have been monitoring the, the, the trends in uh, land usage uh, on the ground now that we have permanent presence there. And these are uh, uh, pivot irrigations also in, in Brazil. Here you see a, a photograph. This one I took uh, a long time ago. This is also in the central uh, Amazon basin. These are all uh, plumes of smoke uh, caused by uh, uh, fires, by burned, by burning, slash and burning is very prevalent. It's been reduced now, but it's still going on. Here you see the same thing in Central America. Each, each one of these little dots, it is a fire, and you see all the smoke coming out. We actually breathe that stuff when it comes in our way into the Houston area. City of Boston in the winter, completely urbanized. Uh, you can see um, what the earth looks like, uh, fully uh, populated by uh, human beings. This Long Island, uh, Long Island and Manhattan right here. And um, the city of uh, Paris, this is the city of Paris right here. All this is in the early spring. And uh, the Hawaiian, Hawaiian Islands, um, the Brahmaputra uh, dumping lots of sediment into the Indian Ocean, you can see here. Uh, images of uh, Cairo, you see the, the, the uh, pyramids right here, uh, very, very imposing. And you can see the change that, that is brought by the presence of water. This is the, the Nile Delta, and see it's another one here, this is the Nile Delta here. You see what the Nile Delta does to that desertic uh, region. And people often say that um, you know, sounds nice that uh, in space there's no, you cannot see the boundaries between nations, uh, which is not, not, not true, not true at all. I think here you can see very clearly the boundary between Israel and uh, Egypt. Uh, and it's very clear, it's a very straight line that uh, uh, is not drawn by, 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 by the earth. The earth at night has become uh, much more stunning these days and we're using more light, more electricity, more power. And this is what the Nile River looks at night, looks like at night. You can see here, completely well traced. Um, and uh, the Florida Peninsula uh, at night also, always totally lit up. The uh, Italian uh, Peninsula as well. See the Italian Peninsula at night, very, very powerful. Uh, in the course of the 25 years that I spent flying, uh, I could see those changes from flight to flight, see how uh, the growth of uh, population uh, advanced. And in the United States, uh, on my first flight, it was hard to see anything in Central, Central America, in the central part of the America, uh, of the United States. Now is quite, uh, quite populated and uh, quite uh, lit up. This is uh, the aurora, uh, beautiful uh, views of the lights coming in from plasma, uh, fluences coming into the magnetic poles and creating those beautiful curtains of light. And this is a, um, an actual uh, image, uh, uh, sequence of images that forms a movie of what it looks like when you fly over uh, and through the auroras. You see the, the size of the atmosphere is very small and that's the atmosphere that protects our planet. That, that is all there is. Canyons that we all know, there is the, uh, the Grand Canyon and canyons that we don't know. These are, this is a canyon in Mars. So these kinds of photographies are now possible because we have objects, we have spacecraft orbiting Mars, taking pictures and measuring what's going on in those, uh, that area. So now, um, what's going on in space uh, in the near term? I mean, here we have sort of a panorama of things. I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening in low Earth orbit, the uh, space station, there's uh, private space stations on their way. The Chinese have their own station, and they're probably gonna build, build more. 
there is uh, you know, tens of thousands of orbiting satellites uh, orbiting the Earth that becoming a, a very cluttered uh, area. It needs to be cleaned up. There is a, a traffic uh, pattern now of activity on the moon. The moon is no longer just the activity of one or two countries, but now we have, you know, we have Europe, we have the Chinese, we have the Japanese, we have the Indians, and of course we have US and the Russians, and other nations will follow. There's a place of activity from many countries uh, supporting a traffic of uh, delivery of cargo and supplies to this area. And then now people are beginning to be uh, very interested in asteroids, near-Earth objects, near-Earth asteroids, some of which are threatening our planet because uh, they're big enough um, to hit and cause damage to cities and population centers, but small enough that we cannot see them. And so we want to be able to look, look for them and detect them and perhaps do something about them. But it's also interesting mining and resources uh, on these bodies and uh, people are beginning to think that way and of course uh, we all dream of a Mars mission in different ways people all want to go to Mars and we too we all want to do that for us as a private company that's the romantic part that's the, the, the part that uh, our investors are not really that interested in they're interested in in a in an ideological sense, but the, the business is right here. And it's a very, a very big business. Um, it's about 300, million, uh, 300 billion dollar business of activities in space. You can see here how it, uh, the pie sort of breaks, breaks up. And uh, so space really has become, and, and will become even more so, a place of business, a place of work a place where people will go not just to fly in space, but to actually carry out uh, revenue generating activity. So we are working on a technology which uh, will enable us to participate in that, uh, that activity. And we call it VASIMIR. VASIMIR is a project that has been going on for nearly uh, 35, maybe even 40 years. This is the latest embodiment of the VASIMIR engine. It is a plasma engine, it is an electric engine. It uses ionized uh, a gas as the working fluid, ejecting it at high speed. And in our case, we work with um, gases such as argon, uh, krypton, xenon, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen. And here we are testing the, the latest uh, version of it, which we call the VX200, the Vasimer experiment at 200 kilowatts. 200 kilowatts is a very powerful engine. Uh, typical uh, electric rockets tend to be roughly in the um, single numbers of kilowatts, maybe five kilowatts. Some are, can be as high as 50 kilowatts. And the ion engine has been around for a long time. Uh, these are simple. Uh, um, devices that extract ions from ionized uh, gases and accelerate them electrically with an electric field. We do things a little differently. But anyway, we've been testing this engine for a while. These are, you can see here, a number of images of the rocket, and this is the exhaust coming out. Um, it is about uh, maybe half a meter in diameter here. This is about uh, perhaps three or four meters in length. It's a very large uh, plume of uh, ionized gas. And um, I think I even have an actual test. Uh, you can see here. This is what it looks like uh, when it fires. It's, this is not a still. This is actual, an actual movie of the engine actually running at uh, full power, 200 kilowatts, with an array of instrumentation sitting in front to measure the performance. We're measuring things like the specific impulse, the thrust, the efficiency of these device. And you can see how hot it is. Uh, the uh, instrumentation uh, doesn't last very long. They, they, they don't last very long. These are ceramic devices uh, that, um, that don't last very long because the temperature is very high. Temperature of the exhaust, if you were to measure the temperature, would be one and a half million degrees. The, pl the, the plasma is um, guided and funneled by a, a magnetic nozzle, a magnetic field, 
is not held together by any physical device, but is, is actually guided and controlled by a magnetic pipe, magnetic, invisible magnetic pipe. And so this is uh, the technology of propulsion for the future. We're moving uh, now to deploy a test article of this device uh, on, uh, in space, and we will, uh, we'll, we're going to try to put it on the International Space Station. We have signed agreements with NASA to do that. Um, this is what it looks like um, at, in full scale in our laboratory. This happens to be the laboratory that, uh, that is doing the, the full integration in uh, 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 northwestern uh, Costa Rica, of all places. Uh, we have our main laboratory right here, down the road here uh, in, uh, in Houston. But some of the uh, supporting uh, tests are being done in Costa Rica. And then we bring the entire device back to Houston for testing and integration and then training uh, at, in the neutral buoyancy uh, laboratory. You see here the size compared to a person. And the whole thing sits in a platform which we call the Aurora. And this uh, platform, what it does is just supports the test. It is a power and propulsion uh, source, uh, power source, that uh, uh, delivers the electricity necessary to run this thing at 200 kilowatts. The space station does not have 200 kilowatts to give us. It doesn't even have 100 kilowatts to give us, or to give anyone. Uh, they will give us more like three, two or three kilowatts. So we will have to charge these uh, batteries over a couple of days uh, so that they Acquire full power, uh, full charge, 50 uh, kilowatt hours, which allows us to do firings at um, 200 kilowatts for 15 minutes. And we are planning to do something on the scale of about 300 uh, to maybe 500 shots of this uh, test uh, at various power levels, not all of them at full power. But the engine in the laboratory has already fired more than 10,000 times at full power in our facility right here in Houston. So uh, performance is very good. Uh, efficiency is uh, 72 percent. The specific impulse is 5,000 seconds. It uh, operates with argon. We have tested it with uh, krypton as well. And the thrust level is like on the order of about six newtons right now at 200 kilowatts. So the performance is very, very good. So this is what it will look like mounted on the side of the uh, Z1 truss of the International Space Station. You can see here. And it will provide a platform for other experiments that NASA wants to do or other experimenters want to do to test technologies that will enable explora exploration deep into the solar system. How do we get it there? Obviously, we don't have the shuttle to get it there, so we will be delivering it by means of one of the two carriers that are certified to send stuff to the space station. In this case, the Cygnus vehicle of Orbital Sciences Corporation, you can see here, it delivers uh, the package. The package gets captured by the arm of the station. The arm picks it up, puts it in a, a specific spot, and then it detaches the carrier vehicle carrier vehicle then is delivered, is, 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 is released, is, is, is uh, uh, disposed of, and then we reposition the arm, pick up the, uh, the package again, and then deliver the, uh, the payload directly to the, to the Z1 where we will attach it. This is basically the procedure to, to do this work. What do we do with this thing, this technology? What are the uses of this technology near term? One of them that's becoming interesting to us is the sweeping of orbital debris. This is what the Earth looks like now with all the populations. Uh, the Sputnik is no longer there, um, but there are many others, of course. Um, now we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of these objects. Some of them are very large, and they are in layers, in different layers above the Earth, in geostationary orbit, in medium-sized orbits, and in low Earth orbit, which is, tends to be the highest uh, traffic uh, that in, in the most dangerous one. Every time these things collide and collisions have occurred, they create fields of debris which create an increase, a sudden increase in the population of these objects. And this is what happened here. A couple of events. Uh, this was uh, 
the collision of uh, a Russian old uh, satellite with an, a live U.S. Uh, satellite, and then uh, another uh, event, which was when the Chinese uh, um, uh, shut down one of their own satellites to test their anti-satellite capability. And so this created a, a sudden jump in the population, but the population will continue to grow. So we've, um, we've developed a concept of a mine sweeper. You could, you could think of it like that, or a, a, an orbital cleaner, which uh, is configured. You can see the engines are just like the ones we will have on the space station. The spacecraft will have a front end, which um, looks a little bit better. Here is essentially a harness with a bunch of uh, small uh, solid rocket um, uh, motors, which will be positioned uh, by a robotic uh, arm onto a uh, detachable carrier, which is this ring right here. It has its own uh, chemical propulsion, and this ring actually goes to the uh, target that we're going to capture. This is a very large object. This is about the size of a school bus. It's about eight tons in, 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 in mass, and it's non-cooperative, meaning that it's spinning, it's tumbling uh, every which way. And so we have to take this uh, little guy over here to uh, enter into some kind of a, of a ballet or dance with it and eventually attached to it. It attaches to a known uh, point, which is the, uh, the nozzle of the, uh, of the rocket, the spent uh, rocket, grabs a hold of it, and then it um, stabilizes it, and it tows it back and attaches it to the mothership. Once that happens, uh, the, um, uh, the, the plasma engines are used then to lower the altitude from the place where we catch it, which is about 800 to 1,000 uh, kilometers, down to about 400 kilometers. And then uh, once we get there, we let it go. You let it go, you don't let, uh, you, you keep the uh, little guy here attached, but you let go of the, of the prey, and um, once it, it falls away, uh, you ignite the uh, stage, the small engine, and that engine does a control the orbit to deliver this package uh, into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this is how you get rid of low orbiting large objects in a control the orbit. Others will be sent up to higher orbits to what we call uh, orbital debris um, cemeteries, you know, places where <laughs> eventually will get full and we will have to clean those, but at least it gets them out of the high traffic environment uh, so that people can carry on their business. Here's another use that we plan to do. This is uh, attaching uh, the engine package and a pair of solar advanced solar arrays in a ring here to the tail of the space station. Uh, in such a way that it keeps the interface open so that uh, uh, visiting vehicles can come and dock as they always do. And the engine is, uh, is canted at a certain angle to go right through the CG, the, the, the thrust to go, goes right through the CG of the station. And this is essentially what, uh, what it would look like when it's actually providing a reboost. As you all know, the space station requires reboost. The space station keeps falling all the time because of drag, uh, very tiny amounts of drag from the atmosphere. And it costs a lot of money to keep it in orbit. It costs, typically you spend on the order of about seven metric tons of rocket fuel per year to keep that station in its orbit. And somebody pays for it. And you can guess who uh, is paying for this. And so, um, Right now, it takes about, uh, cost about 30, roughly $30,000 per kilogram to send stuff up, up there. So you're talking about $210 million a year. And so we do the same job of reboosting for about 20 million. So it's an order of magnitude difference in the cost. And so we consider that a very interesting uh, economic margin, and we will then capitalize on that, on that uh, uh, potential. You've been hearing about asteroid uh, retrieval, asteroid capture. We have our own 
uh, approach to catch, catching some of these rocks. Some of these rocks are big. The ones that are not so big that might be interesting to catch uh, would be maybe 20, uh, 25 meters uh, uh, in diameter, perhaps something not much higher than that. Uh, they get catch, uh, caught in the same way, same type of spacecraft that catches the orbital debris. And now the little guy, instead of carrying a rocket, uh, small rocket motor, it ca carries this, this uh, asteroid catcher basket, which is an inflatable uh, device that opens out, catches the asteroid, and then deflates to smother it, and, 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 and then the, aster the whole thing basically attaches to the asteroid, and it becomes like, an, uh, like a tick, you know, it gets attached like a tick. And then, uh, <laughs> and then the, uh, the uh, controlled um, uh, jets uh, then stabilize the entire uh, device, uh, the, the entire system, and then you can bring it to the mothership and again bring that asteroid for whoever wants it. And we don't really care, you know, what they want. I mean, you, all we're interested in is providing a service. And the services is for NASA or for mining or for whatever. Now, this is another one. Uh, we're now looking at this, this, in, this uh, spacecraft. Again, the same basic engine. We are only developing one type of engine because that's all the money we have, we have for, and is, is, is essentially the Model T, Bassimer. Um, and just like Henry Ford said, oh, they can have any color they want uh, as long as it's black, right? So we, <laughs> so we have only one for now. But uh, you can see here this device has got two sets or two engines and a hinge. And so this thing actually is like a Swiss Army knife and it can open out, it can open up. And the reason we want to do that is because we go to an asteroid and we push with one and we stabilize with the other. And this is like blowing, like a leaf blower, you know, in, in, your, in your yard, blowing things without touching. You don't want to touch the asteroid because the asteroid may be spinning and it also may be rather uh, loosely bound. Uh, the asteroid could be multiple uh, boulders sort of held together very loosely, so you want to be very gentle with this. We're talking about thrust levels that are so tiny of the order of maybe a Newton, a couple of Newtons over periods of the order of several years. And so in this way, it is possible to actually alter the trajectory of an asteroid and, and, and therefore uh, are, uh, you know, avert a, uh, a collision with Earth. Now, you have to know where it is and you have to have detected this asteroid you know, with sufficient advance notice to be able to do this. But this is what uh, we're, uh, we're pointing out. Well, um, we have been looking at going to Mars, and going to Mars uh, with, with humans, uh, you, you start getting into the issues of long duration flight. And long duration flight uh, has many dimensions to it. Uh, one of them, of course, that everybody talks about is the radiation, uh, the radiation uh, uh, threat. It, it is not well known. This, uh, this whole topic of radiation is still very fuzzy, very uh, unknown, but this is what the present uh, levels of radiation allowances are um, by the uh, U.S. Um, uh, OSHA. And for example, you can see here uh, the max occupational exposure uh, on uh, radiation workers on the ground. You can see here what it uh, entails, six months on the International Space Station during solar max. Uh, you can see what that is. And six months to stay on, this, uh, on the station during solar minimum, and again, so on. The more you, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the arrow points to higher and higher levels, and, and the axis here is the time it takes to go uh, to Mars and back, because obviously you want to go and come back, otherwise, at least my mom won't let me go. I just, just say, well, you got to come back. It's very important that you come back. And so what we've done is that we have um, uh, added only the flight time because it's very important when you arrive at Mars where Mars is with respect to the Earth. Uh, if it's in the right position, then 
uh, you might be able to come back on the same year. But if not, then you have to wait until the position of the planets is favorable. And it takes usually about two years to, to do that. So it's a very long uh, stay in a new planet, obviously, where we can't really breathe the air completely. Anyway, lots of challenges. Um, so we only look at the flight uh, time because we figure that when people land on Mars, uh, they'll be able to maybe seek shelter. Maybe there will be ways in which we can protect ourselves from the radiation. But when you're in flight, you're much more exposed. So uh, these are the flight times. And um, what we have here is a number of curves that have uh, minimums. And you can see um, various minimums. Uh, for example, this one right here uh, says that you can make the, the round trip uh, mission in just over or just under 300 days. Uh, and these curves all depend on a quantity called the alpha. Alpha is a sort of a magic number. It's called the kilograms per kilowatt for the power and the propulsion system together. So if you have an electric rocket, such as a Vasimir or any other electric rocket, you have to give it electricity. And the electricity has to come from somewhere. And it's not likely to come from a solar uh, panel. Because you know, you're far away from the sun, and there's not a lot of sun. And so these panels get bigger and bigger. So you really are looking at nuclear power. And nuclear power will be an essential ingredient in a robust human exploration of the solar system. There's no way around it. And so there are two ways in which you can achieve this um, uh, nuclear option. One is nuclear thermal, and the other one is nuclear electric. The nuclear thermal rocket was actually developed in the 60s. And I remember back when I was a graduate student, Project NERVA was uh, uh, being tested in, um, in uh, Jackass Flats in Idaho. Uh, very powerful rocket, and the idea was simply to have a nuclear pile uh, producing a lot of heat, and you flow uh, high pressure hydrogen through it, and of course it gets really hot, and you get a rocket. Uh, a rocket which is about twice as good as the best chemical rocket that we have. And it cannot go much more than that. This is about as, as good as it will get. So the nuclear thermal rocket, if you were to use a nuclear thermal rocket, which is what NASA is considering in their projections, you will be here. This is the NTR line. This is essentially the trip that they are talking about. We believe that the way to do this is to go with the nuclear electric approach uh, with a high power electric rocket with a high power source. The key is, can you make the reactor lightweight? And that is where the alpha comes in. The lower the alpha, the, the lighter this reactor uh, is. Now the reactors um, of alphas less than 10 are, do not exist. Even reactors of alphas uh, of 100, maybe, could be possible. But there are credible designs that, um, that are uh, being proposed using uh, things like magnetohydrodynamic power conversion, other techniques uh, that would possibly develop a reactor uh, with alphas uh, down, down, and even down to one or two or even less. And so this is the promise. This is where the promise is and this is where the technology focus ought to be to study the capability because clearly humans are gonna go to Mars and we're not gonna stop there. You know, Mars is just a waypoint, like many others, like the moon, like the asteroids and the libration points and I often tell people that you know, our really our destination really is the stars. And all these others are just waypoints en route. And so we have to make, do the homework and get into this type of technology to enable robust transportation um, in the solar system at least for now. 
Later, other people who will be really smart will get us to the stars. But for now, this is the backyard. This is the conceptual design of a rocket ship that could conceivably do that kind of a flight. This uh, rocket is big. It's a very large uh, uh, vehicle. It's very much something that we would not launch from the Earth. We would assemble it like we assembled the International Space Station. In fact, its uh, mass is not that much different from that of the space station. This one is about 500 metric tons. The space station is roughly that. Um, and you can see here tanks of hydrogen, which will be the propellant. The hydrogen will be um, converted into plasma, which will come out here in the exhaust of these engines. And the reactors are these reactors right here. There are four. We have to have enough redundancy, and you want to be able to have uh, uh, enough reactors so that you can tolerate failures in one and continue to go. This testing of these engines uh, at um, uh, several megawatts are not going to be done in our facility here uh, because there is no vacuum chamber on planet Earth that could sustain these kinds of engines firing. Uh, nor are they going to be done on the International Space Station because we don't have the power there and also it would, it would do something to the orbit of the, spa of the space station. So we we're not going to do that. Most likely we will do them on the moon. So our company already, uh, as part of our private business plan, is we will plan to have a test facility on the moon, on the surface of the moon, and our workers will go there it's only a three-day flight to, uh, to, to work and come back in time for vacation. So I just have a couple pictures uh, to show you uh, and then close. Uh, this picture is one that uh, I got uh, a long time ago from the guys at uh, the Planetary Society. Um, and you, you probably have seen it many times. but. Uh, is a picture taken by uh, one of the Voyagers, uh, one of the Voyager spacecraft, uh, almost to the edge of the solar system. When I remember Carl Sagan uh, uh, came up with the idea that uh, it would be a good idea for the spacecraft to turn around and take a picture of what it looked like behind it. And it did. And it took a picture of uh, all these points of light, uh, Venus, uh, Earth, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and all the others uh, who were behind the sun could not be seen, but, but there, is, uh, there, is, uh, there is our Earth right there. And I, I remember Carl used to t tell us, um, you know, we are all there. This is, this is where we all are, of all kinds of people, good ones and bad ones. Uh, they're all right there. And uh, someday a human being will be able to take that picture from its spacecraft or his spacecraft. And so the sunset uh, on Mars taken by one of the uh, robotic craft, one of the rovers, um, a beautiful sight that again one of our children or grandchildren will take that picture and hopefully will send it on, a, on the iPhone, uh, put, it, <laughs> put it on Facebook or something. Hey, look at where I am, mom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great talk. I'm sure if you have any questions, uh, he, <clears throat> he knows everything that can be known, and I know the rest. So <laughs> please, please direct your questions to him. <laughs> Yeah, wh why do you need to go all the way to the moon to set up the test lab uh, rather than uh, just uh, out, out in orbit around the Earth somewhere? Well, the reason is because the moon is a place uh, that has gravity. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a good, stable place. Uh, you also could um, uh, generate a lot of power there with uh, solar, uh, solar panels. You've got plenty of room, plenty of... Uh, land to uh, have a power station. And um, we're looking for the vacuum 
you know, the vacuum is essential for testing these rockets. These rockets do not uh, work in the atmosphere, so we could not test them outside of, uh, uh, out on the open uh, atmosphere. We have to have a vacuum chamber. If we put it in orbit, we would have to provide all of that. Uh, we would have to provide power and um, have all of the necessary infrastructure to actually do the test without having the engine uh, affect the orbit of the facility where it is uh, being tested. I hope that, does that answer the question? A, sta a stable place, yeah, a stable, easy place. Uh, exactly, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the short answer, you're right. Uh, one of the things that's always mentioned, and you mentioned it in your, in your presentation, is the uh, cosmic radiation threat to astronauts uh, traveling to Mars. Um, is it, and, and what we usually hear then is, uh, and you mentioned OSHA standards and radiation standards, etc. But aren't those standards completely unrealistic? And there was, I believe in 2001 in National Geographic, in one of their articles on potential Mars expeditions, a graph that basically showed the potential exposure to astronauts on a trip to Mars and back mm -hmm. as basically at, in a similar order of magnitude as what people are exposed to in the highest background radiation yeah. on planet yes, Earth at yes. Ramsar, Iran. Yes. Is that reasonably correct? That I've heard yes. I, I've heard you're, you're correct, and, and you know this whole topic of radiation is very controversial, and I, I don't pretend to to be an expert on it. In fact, I'm not an expert on it. I'm just an engineer. But the the thing that um, I remember from spaceflight is that radiation was one of the things that people worried about. I uh, got uh, a little bit less uh, dose than most uh, crew members. I don't know why but my dosimeter had a lower reading for some reason. And um, uh, I, I, I felt that the most uh, serious um, effect was not radiation. Uh, it was more the general deconditioning of the body. Uh, we are now making great inroads in that, in, with exercise, a very, very careful diet, uh, so I think there is a tremendous amount of work that has gotten us to be much more uh, resilient to the uh, radiation. Um, but um, I think that it makes sense to go fast. I mean, you know, for all reasons. Uh, because you use less food, because you have less opportunity for things to go wrong and because you get less radiation and less deconditioning and, and because you don't want to just stop at Mars. You want to you wanna have a, a, a robust infrastructure transportation that allows you to go many times and go everywhere. And it's not a Apollo mentality. We don't want to do the Apollo over again because then we're going to have to wait another 50 years or so before we go back. We want to build a scaffolding, we want to build a capability that is sustainable. I think this is my personal belief, but you know, I, I, I think there are other beliefs and I completely respect that we other people's. When you test uh, Vasmir on the space station, what will you do with the thrust to keep it from altering the orbit? Yes. That is a, a, a very uh, important question, and we have wrestled with that. Uh, the thrusting will be done at 90 degrees from the direction of motion. So the, uh, the change in the orbital parameters will be very tiny. Uh, the thrust will be very small, will be uh, six newtons at full power, um, and only for 15 minutes. So it's a very tiny amount, and so we will change only uh, infinitesimally the orbital plane, but not the altitude of the, uh, of the orbit, because we're, we're, we're firing at 90 degrees to the direction of motion. And um, we are going to be firing um, 
offset from the center of mass of the station just a tiny bit um, because that's the way we're going to measure the actual performance of the rocket. The, um, uh, there's a lot of controversy over uh, performance uh, and everybody has their own laboratory, instrumentation, their own, their own uh, thrust stand where they you know, measure performance and everybody broadcasts different performances. Here we will have a no argument as to what is the performance, so that's why. Okay. Yeah, just first of all, I'd like to address uh, what you brought up, which is radiation. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the scientists associated with the Mars Science Lab, the RAD instrument, pr announced their results, and they measured the radiation dose rate on the way to Mars. And they announced that uh, based on those measurements, and assuming a, a conventional trajectory, which is six months out, six months back, year and a half on the surface, the round trip radiation dose would be 0.6 sieverts, or 60 rem. Okay, that's over two and a half years. Now, yes, exactly. Okay, for those who are not acquainted with that, th there's a report known as the BEIR report, uh, Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. It is the gold standard for this. And that dose represents a 1% risk of getting a fatal cancer sometime in the next quarter century afterwards, which would indeed represent a modest portion of total mission risk if you consider the fact that, for instance, every time uh, Dr. Chang's Diaz flew on the shuttle, there was a 2% chance of being blown to pieces um, based on the actual track record of the shuttle. Okay? And so a Mars mission, which involves launch to orbit, trans-Mars injection, trans-Mars cruise, Mars capture, Mars landing, Mars operations, Mars ascent, trans-Earth injection, so forth, so forth, is clearly going to be more risky than a shuttle mission by probably at least a factor of five, no matter how carefully it is engineered. And so this would represent a modest portion of mission risk. And therefore, it is it's not reasonable to make radiation the center of one's attention and uh, with respect to this, and given that conventional systems, either chemical or nuclear, thermal, can do the mission in six months, that is six-month transit, the, the radiation must not be considered a showstopper on the way to Mars. Now, the, the reason for, the, the six-month transit is actually highly advantageous because it is also the free return trajectory. That is the same trajectory that flies you out to Mars on a six-month transit. If you choose to abort the mission, it will loop around and come back to Earth exactly two years after when you left. So Earth will be there. If you try to get to Mars faster than that, you won't have that free return. And so that it introduces an element of mission risk for the sake of a trivial reduction in radiation exposure. So. Now, if you are going out farther than Mars, okay, where, okay, as Dr. Chang Sti has said, for realistic alphas, because the alpha of 10 that he showed that was competitive in flight time to conventional propulsion uh, is way off in the future, okay? That's not in the cards. For realistic alphas, the, the electrical propulsion is slower than conventional propulsion for Mars. But if you're going much further, the electrical propulsions have time to speed up and get you there a lot faster. But th that's where this stands. So uh, some people may know that I have disagreements with Chang Zias that I have printed. And they hang on the issue of the idea of whether this technology is necessary to go to Mars, which I disagree with. But I think it has tremendous utility if for certain other applications that he mentioned here and also for going beyond Mars. So, was there a question or? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, but no. Okay. No, I appreciate, I appreciate uh, Bob. Uh, you know, Bob and I have disagreed and, and I really don't disagree. Uh, I mean, I think people can choose uh, how they want to go to Mars. If they want to take the slow boat, that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with that. I like to go fast. And uh, maybe that's just my, my, my upbringing. But um, I, um, I really believe that one of the reasons we are today in this predicament uh, in that 
you know, we haven't returned to the moon is because we built a mission which was uh, an awesome thing, uh, a remarkable achievement, but it was a one-shot deal. It had no sustainability, no ability to continue doing it. And I think that we don't want to make the same mistake. Uh, we want to uh, hunker down, do the homework, develop the technology that we need to Radiation really is not a short travel yeah. uh, you know, in space uh, fast and uh, robust. So, but it's a disagreement that I'm, I'm comfortable and totally okay with. with I'd like saying. to understand the thrust program a little better. Uh, do you apply, how much delta V is needed in order to get to Mars faster? Do you apply it continuously? Yes. Or do you apply it in spurts? No, no, no. We apply, we, we don't do the typical um, uh, impulsive burns, which we have learned to use uh, using chemical propulsion. We use continuous thrust. Continuous thrust. Continuous thrust. And so you accelerate, in essence, half the time and decelerate the other half. How much delta V is, what, what does the total delta V come to in order to get to Mars? The delta V, I mean, we don't think like that. We don't think in delta V. Well, uh, thrust, delta I mean, V implies that you uh, change, um, a, you, you impart a instantaneous velocity change. Okay, what is the object. integral of... Uh, it's, it's the energy. It really yeah. is the energy. It's, it's the energy. And you do what you have to do to deliver the payload to, uh, to Mars. The payload is small. You need a smaller delta energy. If your payload is bigger, then you need a bigger delta energy. So, uh, Do you apply uh, maximum thrust continuously? Yes. Now, let me explain. Uh, or oh, is, it, is it programmed? Yes, there is a program, and this is unique about the way the, the plasma engine works. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to draw a, a, a similarity here. Um, you have a certain amount of power available. Say you have a nuclear reactor which delivers uh, 100 megawatts, or maybe 1 megawatt, or maybe 10 megawatts of power. You have that available to you. And the question is, how do you use that power? Do you, do you put most of your power in the form of thrust, or do you put more power in the form of specific impulse? There is a, there is a difference. It's very similar to the workings of a transmission in a car, in, a, in an automobile. You have a limited amount of power because your engine has so many horsepower but you have a transmission, it's the same one that, not the same one that you talked about. <laughs> but you have a transmission which allows you to exchange uh, torque on the wheels for RPM. So if you're climbing a hill, which you do in space, in, in space you're climbing a hill, you want to start out with a low gear, a low uh, specific impulse, a lower specific impulse. And as you climb and get into flatter terrain, you would like to um, upshift to a higher specific impulse. And so the way the, the, the plasma engine works is it has a variable specific impulse. It is able to shift gears in essence. And this variability of specific impulse has actually already been measured in our, in our, in our test article. We will not use it for operations near Earth because working in low gear uh, near Earth is fine. But going to Mars, you do. You do want it. And so the, the specific impulse will be varied in two forms. One, by changing uh, from argon to krypton gas, which we have tested. So you, you're shifting propellants. Uh, argon is a little lighter. Krypton is a little heavier, so um, a higher specific impulse rocket means that the exhaust particle, the particles that go out of the exhaust go a little faster, so you want lighter particles to do that. And a lower specific impulse gives you more thrust, you want more mass, more massive particles to go out. 
So this is the game that we play in interplanetary trajectories. And our, our trajectories are trajectories with variable specific impulse, not with constant specific impulse, which is what most rockets today have. So that's how we do it. Uh, that's, that is a good partial answer. What is the maximum specific impulse that you would get out of this engine? Maximum right now uh, is about 5,000 seconds with argon. 5,000 seconds. 5,000 seconds with argon. That's, that's more than 10 times of, of the best chemical rocket. That's true. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. With hydrogen, we actually would probably measure something on the order of 10,000 seconds, maybe even higher than that. Is there ever a concern of running out of propellant? Uh, actually, uh, it's like I, driving electric car. Yeah, uh, you, yeah. Actually, you get range anxiety. Yeah. And, let me uh, explain. Uh, let me explain something uh, having to do with the propellant. Uh, in the shuttle, we used to simulate, and you know, uh, in, in, in the in the in the simulations, we just used to simulate uh, losses of propellant. That is, you are en route to Mars, and all of a sudden you lose, uh, you have a leak in your tank, and you lose, uh, you know, X percentage of your propellant, say 20%, 30% of your propellant. What do you do? In a conventional uh, constant specific impulse rocket, you uh, only have so much delta V available in your tank because the specific impulse is a constant. So what you do in our case is you change the specific impulse profile so that the remaining propellant is used at a, at a higher specific impulse. You use uh, more of the high gear uh, format than the low gear format. That's roughly what you do. Yes, that's correct. The way we the way we do this is we we have to turn around and flip the the uh, the ship around and begin to decelerate, typically about halfway to Mars. And what we require is that you enter the Martian gravity sphere of influence at a certain speed, because then Mars is going to be pulling you in. And you want to hit the uh, you want to get to a point where the, the landing craft separates from the mother ship. The mother ship never really lands on Mars. The mother ship actually goes by Mars and the landing craft separates. The landing craft then enters into an aerobraking maneuver onto the atmosphere of Mars. Um, and so we have to have a speed limit there uh, and we're calling it uh, 10 uh, kilometers per second entry velocity at Mars. I think uh, the engineers at NASA are now thinking more like 12 uh, kilometers per second of entry, entry speed. Uh, we are keeping it at 10, but that's what we do. We slow down with the, uh, the, the atmosphere. Yes, then the, ten, then the chemical rocket will land. The landing uh, and, the, uh, and the liftoff will all be done by chemical rockets, and the, the, the Mars ship will not be purely electric. It will have chemical c capability. Uh, obviously, we'll need the chemical rocket to get, get off the Earth and assemble the mission. The mission will probably depart from the uh, Lagrange point will not be assembled in low Earth orbit, particularly if you have reactors. And the reactors will probably be flown in pieces, not as a single unit, just to make extra sure that uh, there's not gonna be an accidental critical, critical event because um, you know, those will be highly enriched uh, uranium reactors. So, um, so there's lots of sort of mission architecture uh, things that we, we have to look at. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, <clears throat> if the questions go on much farther, we're going to have to have another meal. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to uh, close by asking a question. Um, 
we've been talking about radiation, and the question is, uh, what profession exposes its workers to the least radiation? Sailors on a nuclear submarine. So there you have it. Okay, thanks very much, folks. Give a hand of uh, Franklin Chandler.